Blessed be the one holy and living God. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Please be seated. A reading from Leviticus. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slander among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your, you shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Let us read responsively at the half verse. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. They are like trees planted by the streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, the way of the wicked is doomed. A 
A reading from 1 Thessalonians. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God. In spite of great opposition, for our appeal does does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God, who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with the pretext for greed nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you have become very dear to us. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the spirit calls him Lord saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. there are any of you who secretly desire right one or remember it, you will know the two great commandments from the very beginning of that service. Jesus last week on earth continues in our gospel readings and the Pharisees were still at it, putting Jesus to the test, trying to stump him before the crowds. 
This time, an expert in the Jewish law asked him the question, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Of course, everyone with an earshot knew the answer to that one. Good Jews pray this text from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Make note of that, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, twice daily. The prayer is called the Shema, which is Hebrew for hear or listen. Listen, O Israel, is how it begins. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. It goes on from there, but that is the very beginning of it. Jewish teaching on this subject was clear and absolute, and Jesus knew it really well. This is the greatest commandment. But before the lawyers could take a breath and follow up, however, Jesus continued with a line from today's Leviticus reading that Brett read to us, a line which they also would have known. He continued, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Rabbis, Pharisees, temple lawyers, any good Jew would have known these two verses and could have recited them in their sleep. All Jesus did was condense the Ten Commandments. Commandments one through four equal love God and honor God. And commandments five through ten love and honor your neighbor. This is fundamental human ethics in the sight of God. This reply was as brilliant as it was simple. In Jesus' condensed form, its truth is inescapable. Jesus' genius was not that he created new doctrines uh, that, wo uh, that would have wowed the people, nor was it his ability to preach interesting sermons. His genius was in his clarity of vision, his ability to distill all of Israel's 613 complex laws in life to its very essence of two. This was, Jesus was able to simplify the complex with unarguable clarity. In fact, there's quite a bit of ink spilled throughout the Gospels where Jesus says, if you love God, show it by loving all of God's children, all of God's children. God is not very much on mushy feelings. Jesus says, in essence, put your money where your mouth is. What I get from that is that the word love is first and foremost an action verb. When I was in my early teens, I had the great fortune of having a pastor in this little country Methodist church our family belonged to. And this pastor understood that the gospel was all about love. In how he talked to us, in how he treated others, in how he talked about others, in how he worked with kids, in how he preached, and in how he sang, it was most obvious to all of us youngsters and to most of our oldsters in the congregation that Pastor Tom Ellisor exuded love because he knew it and he lived it. He loved God and because he did, so we came to know and love God as well as all of God's children who were made in God's image. Please note that this was in Southern Alabama in the Jim Crow South, and he did wrinkle a few feathers. We kids got the message. Where there were specific carve-outs that the old generation seemed to live by, Pastor Ellisor confronted them. He made sure that at least the younger generation would love God and love our neighbors without exceptions. The kids got the lessons, but the adults were not so happy. As a teen, 
I know that God's love has no exception and was a deep down comfort. As I've grown older, however, Jesus' commandment to love doesn't bring me as much comfort. In fact, it makes me decidedly uncomfortable for the simple reason that I live in a world surrounded by people who don't live by these two great commandments. It's one thing to know that God loves us unconditionally. It's quite another to realize that in the final judgment, our ability to show love to others is the ultimate barometer of how we love God. When I watch the evening news, I see the world that I pay taxes to seems to do all it can to not live by the great commandments. I'm not talking religion here, but basic human ethics. All the network news each evening has to end with a feel-good story. Have you noticed that? It mollifies the bad taste that all of the other stories for the last 27 minutes and all the advertisements left us with. All it does is remind me that this world we've built is going fast to hell, and we're not doing anything to change that. Jesus doesn't seem to care that our theology is sufficiently up to snuff, or that we attend church regularly. I suspect that he does care that the so-called Christian nationalists are trying to call the shots in our government and are doing anything but showing love. No, what Jesus seems to really care about is whether we have seen the image of God in the least of our sisters and brothers and have loved them as such. He too lived in a time of political turmoil, of war, when the political powers that ran things destroyed the temple in less than 40 years after they crucified him. When we see the homeless sleeping on park benches and digging through the dumpsters uh, full of discarded pizza swill behind Mackenzie River, for a morsel of crust to eat, do we see Christ or do we see something else? Do we become something less ourselves? If we aren't living love as a verb, we aren't following Jesus and we aren't fixing this terrarium that God left us with to care for. Jesus' radical call to love doesn't end there. Jesus calls us to love and to see the divine image in the least of his children, and yes, even in our enemies. In terms of worldly logic, this does not make any sense at all. We have to have enemies, don't we? After all, we have a military. It just seems foolish to try and love our enemies, enemies who may hate us or even want to kill us. But in terms of the soul, Jesus' call to love is the only thing that really does make sense. It really is all or nothing. If, when we open our eyes, we cannot see God in all things, we fail to perceive God. If we cannot see God in all things, we worship a God we have manufactured. We may see beauty, power, and majesty, but it may not be God. If God is in our enemies, how can we not love them? As the law points out today in Leviticus, we may need to reprove them. Boy, there's a word that did not come up at the breakfast table this morning. <laughs> Reproving someone doesn't mean we don't love them. We reprove our teenagers when they're growing up. Our politicians, for example, need reproving and not our disdain, much as we prefer the latter. Write your congressmen and your senators. The Pharisees knew all the words of scripture, but perhaps without knowing their deeper meaning. They knew that we are called to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and might. But they failed to recognize that one cannot love God if one does not love the neighbor. 
Perhaps the Pharisees could be excused, but we can't. We know we have no excuse for acting as if we don't know any better. We do. Will we act in love, or will we hold on to our fears and our grievances? Ultimately, whether or not it makes sense to love our neighbors and our enemies, this I know. Without this love, our lives do not make sense. They only make sense in God, the God who is love itself. I'm going to close with a little story. There was a famous monastery which had fallen on very hard times. Formerly, its many buildings were filled with young monks, and its big church resounded with the singing of chant. But now it was deserted. People no longer came there to be nourished by prayer. A handful of old monks shuffled through the cloisters and praised God with heavy hearts. On the edge of the monastery woods, an old rabbi had built a little hut. He would come there from time to time to fast and pray. No one ever spoke to him, but whenever he appeared, the word would be passed from monk to monk. The rabbi walks in the woods, and for as long as he was there, the monks would feel sustained. Two embraced like long lost brothers. Then they stepped back and just stood there smiling at one another with smiles that their faces could hardly contain. After a while, the rabbi motioned the abbot to enter. In the middle of the room was a wooden table with the scriptures on it. They sat there for a moment in the presence of the book. Then the rabbi began to cry. The abbot could not contain himself. He covered his face with his hands and began to cry as well. For the first time in his life, he cried his heart out. The two men sat there like lost children, filling the hut with their sobs and wetting the wood of the table with their tears. As the tears had ceased to flow, and all was quiet again, the rabbi lifted his head. You and your brothers are serving God with heavy hearts, he said. You have come to ask a teaching of me. I will give you a teaching, but you can only repeat it once. After that, no one, no one, no one must ever say it aloud again. The rabbi looked straight at the abbot and said, the Messiah is among you. For a while, all was silent. Then the rabbi said, now you must go. The abbot left without a word and without ever looking back. The next morning, the abbot called his monks together in the chapter room. He told them he had received the teaching from the rabbi who walks in the woods, and that his teaching was never again to be spoken aloud. Then he looked at each of his brothers and said, the rabbi said that one of us is the Messiah. The monks were startled by this saying. What could it mean? They asked themselves, is Brother John the Messiah, or, or Father Matthew, or Brother Thomas? Am I the Messiah? What could this mean? They were all deeply puzzled by the rabbi's teaching, but no one ever mentioned it again. As time went by, the monks began to treat one another with a very special reverence. There was a gentle, wholehearted, human quality about them now, which was hard to describe, but easy to notice. They lived with one another as men who had finally found something, 
but they prayed the scripture today, uh, together as men who were always looking for something. Occasional visitors found themselves deeply moved by the life of these monks. Before long, people were coming from far and wide to be nourished by the prayer life of the monks, and the young men were asking once again to become part of this community. In those days, the rabbi no longer walked in the woods. His hut had fallen into ruins. But somehow or other, the old monks who had taken his teaching to heart still felt sustained by his prayerful presence. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have. Friends, the Lord has been your refuge from one generation to another. Let us pray to God, saying, Show your servants your works, O Lord. And be gracious to us. We pray for the leaders of the church. Give bishops, priests, deacons, and lay leaders gentle and loving hearts. Empower us to share the gospel and ourselves with those in need. Show your servants your works, O oh Lord. And be gracious to us. We pray for all humankind. Prosper the work of our hands. May all those who work earn a fair wage. May those without work find strength and encouragement in your love. Give us hearts to respect the dignity of every human being. Show your servants your works, O Lord. And be gracious to us. We pray for all creation. We, you brought forth the mountains. You gave birth to the land and the earth. Give us the desire and will to care for all you have made. Show your servants your works, O Lord. And be gracious to us. We pray for the areas in our life, areas in which we live. Oh God, we want to obey what you command. Help us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Show your servants your works, O oh Lord. And be gracious to us. 
We pray for the afflicted and the suffering, and we pray for those who weep and mourn. Nurse them back to health as a mother tenderly nurses her children. Show your servants your works, O Lord. And be gracious to us. We pray for those who have died. Though we, swept, though we are swept away like a dream in this mortal life, you promise to raise us to life immortal through your Son. May your gracious, O Lord, be upon us. For Bruce Robertson, Michael and Charles. Show your servants your works, O Lord. And be gracious to us. Let us confess our sins to God. <coughs> God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you. In thought, word, and deed. We have denied your goodness to each other in ourselves and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil we have done. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. My sisters and brothers, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Good morning. Welcome to St. James. What announcements do we have this morning that need to be made that are not in the bulletin or things in the bulletin that need to be, uh, need to be uh, emphasized? I have, I have one, and that is, um, as we are expecting a new rector one of these days, I want to be sure that we get pictures of everyone so Ray has his camera. We need pictures, individual pictures, just at the back of the church and then a family so that the rector will be able to say who goes with whom. And uh, the pictures we have in the database are almost 10 years old, so we don't look like we used to look. <laughs> Which is okay for some of us, okay? <laughs> So please uh, stop and see Ray. Uh, we'll try to get it over the next few weeks, uh, get pictures of everybody. But I'm going to be coming after you if your picture isn't newly updated. Um, I'm assuming some of you are already aware of this, but for those of, the, of you that aren't, 
uh, Reverend Sweeney, uh, Sylvia Sweeney was hacked and so were a lot of us and we all received uh, texts asking for money. Don't do it. <laughs> Whatever you do, uh, spread the word to others that you know. Um, it, it's an old hack, but it still is very damaging. So if you get something, my first clue was the phone number was not her phone number. <laughs> and uh, that was the first clue that something was wrong. So just be very aware, if you get something from her, she did not send it. <laughs> That has happened to the dean of our cathedral several times now in his tenure here. Uh, another announcement? <laughs> other announcements? We have, uh, oh, yes. there, there should be, there should be, uh, paper bags in the pews? Uh, I, are there? Okay, do you know what those are? Ah, write the names of loved ones who have gone beyond the veil to the other side who are worshiping God this morning in God's presence and write their names on the bag. If you've got a marker, that's even better. And the youth group, I do believe, will be making luminaria out of these. And this will be next Sunday afternoon, in late afternoon, along with refreshments afterwards. This will be in Canterbury Park. Um, you all know where Canterbury Park is, I think. Um, so right across the street if you're new to St. James. Um, and there's one more thing. Well, I'm not done yet. Uh, next Sunday is All Saints Sunday. Uh, this. Uh, uh, this Wednesday is All Saints Day. Tuesday night, of course, is All Saints Eve, and we're not going to have a service, and we will move uh, All Saints Day to next Sunday. It's one of the great feasts of the year, and it's one of those days that's most appropriate for us, as I've been hammering away, to renew our baptismal covenant. And so that will be part of the service next week. Uh, the principal feasts of the service of the church year are Easter, Pentecost, Christmas is about third in there. Those two, first two should be the tops, and then All Saints Day and the baptism of Christ uh, in January. So these are, this is a major feast. Ty, uh, what was it? And there is coffee hour after the service downstairs. Great coffee hour, the eighth sacrament. The Thank birthday. you. Yes. Uh, we had uh, our birthdays, anniversaries, and travelers. Uh, Judith does travel a lot. <laughs> All right. Uh, great. Uh, we, will, we will pray the prayer for birthdays, travelers, and anniversaries. I'm back from Oklahoma seeing my granddaughters and my great-grandbabies, which was wonderful. And I'm back from Washington, D.C., where um, I was flown out for an AA, a big AARP event. And thank you. Wow. Thank you. Nice having a flourish. <laughs> and I'm about to go to Chicago for um, an Obama al staff alumni reunion with the president. Um, thank you. I'm really excited about that. And I've never been to Chicago before, so I'm going to see a couple of sites. Thank you. Such a wonderful city. I am Mary, and Tuesday I get to celebrate a zero birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Zero. Oh, zero. yes. All right. Those are nice. I'm Bryce, and yesterday my husband and I celebrated our 10th anniversary. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. We will pray for all of you for anniversary, birthday, and traveling. Join with me in your bulletin. Lord God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, in your servants. Surround them with your love and care. Protect them from every danger. Keep them safe in the knowledge of your love. This we ask through Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and always. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and always. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you both. We have something new in our presence, and Connie will be breaking it in at the next service. How many of you noticed the new piano? This is absolutely gorgeous. And I understand that if I were using holy water to sprinkle it and bless it, it would not hurt it because it has a urethane finish but I'm not going to chance it. <laughs> Let us pray. Connie, do you want to be here with it? Yes. Since she's the one who will be making it sound. Stay for the second service to hear this beauty. Uh, uh, yes. They sing to the tambourine and the lyre and rejoice to the sound of the pipes. Praise him with the sound of trumpet. Praise him with lyre and harp. Let us pray. O oh God, before whose throne trumpets sound and saints and angels sing the songs of Moses and the Lamb, accept this beautiful piano for the worship of your temple that with the voice of music we, we may proclaim your praise and tell it abroad through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. And now we can play it. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We praise you and bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creations. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, every living thing. You made us in your image, taught us to walk in your ways, but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with angels and saints and with the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. <laughs> Praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You look with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the, on the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ, crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, Bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now let us pray in the prayer language of our hearts. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God of promise, you have prepared a banquet for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. the gifts of God for the people of God.
let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life. May God bless you with discomfort and easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. Amen. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that your work for justice, freedom, and peace. Amen. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. Amen. Amen. May God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all God's children and the poor. Amen. Amen. These blessings are yours, not for the asking, but for the giving. From one who wants to be your companion, our God, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen. peace to love and serve the Lord.
lifting up and moving. Oh, yes. God, would they, they have to lift it up, right, to bring it to you? Or do they have a dolly? Oh, yeah. Okay. And they take it like this. So it's 90 degrees. And they have to put it on the dolly. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, and they have it on a dolly. And then they... So then what we can do 